observe how to generate bodhicitta at all times. This is important. We should constantly observe how to generate bodhicitta 24 hours a day. When bodhicitta is absent, we should strive to arouse and maintain it without losing it. How to activate compassion for sentient beings. This is the analytical meditation taught in the stages of the path to enlightenment. Some videos are quite good. Today, I watched a video that I think can help us cultivate compassion, particularly equanimity. The video is about animals protecting each other. They behave just like humans. In the video, when a sheep was about to be slaughtered, another sheep hid the knife. When a dog got injured, another dog stayed there to seek help from humans. A bullfighter felt uncomfortable during the bullfight and sat in a corner. The bull he was fighting approached him as if worrying about him. A sentence was shown at the bottom of the screen. Who is the real beast? Before that, the bullfighter stabbed the bull several times with his sword. However, not only did the bull not get angry, but it also seemed to come over and comfort him when it saw him feeling unwell. This shows that animals have empathy. A baby dolphin died and its mother carried its body while swimming around. A dog followed its owner for 17 years. After its owner passed away, the dog circled his grave twice and then jumped into a river to end its life. This dog chose to follow its owner after he died. What a loyal dog. Animals also have Buddha nature. From this perspective, all living beings have Buddha nature. We can cultivate equanimity and compassion from this perspective. If you have generated bodhicitta, that is excellent. If you haven't, do not remain that way. Always rely on the teacher who gives this kind of teaching and associate with those who are training their minds in this way. If you have already generated bodhicitta, which is certainly great, you should strive to maintain compassion and kindness towards sentient beings. If you haven't generated bodhicitta, you shouldn't remain in your current state of mind. This means if you forget or haven't generated bodhicitta, you shouldn't stay in your present state of mind. Otherwise, you are not on the path to enlightenment and will be further away from attaining Buddhahood. You may develop more non-Buddhist or Hinayana tendencies. Without bodhicitta, practicing meditation is nurturing non-Buddhist and Hinayana tendencies. Although you may appear to practice sitting meditation, the essence is different. What is the meditation practice in Mahayana Buddhism? It is called Samadhi. What does it mean? The meditation practice infused with Buddhicitta is called Samadhi. Buddhisattvas enter countless Samadhis to guide sentient beings, with Buddhicitta as the core, though the forms can vary. The countless samadhis stem from different aspirations, yet bodhicitta is the core. The aspirations of bodhisattvas vary, so the manifested samadhis are different. If you haven't generated bodhicitta, you shouldn't dwell in your current state of mind. You may appear to engage in sitting meditation, but you are actually nurturing non-Buddhist or Hinayana tendencies. This is alarming. You may think you are making efforts, but in reality you are... Therefore, we should earnestly cultivate and strengthen bodhicitta.
If you haven't generated bodhicitta, you should follow a teacher who gives teachings on bodhicitta. Additionally, you should regularly associate and practice with those who are cultivating bodhicitta to motivate yourself. It is beneficial to be close to spiritual friends who are cultivating bodhicitta. For those who have just generated bodhicitta, good spiritual teachers and friends are crucial. They can create a good learning environment that helps the arising and strengthening of bodhicitta. This passage emphasizes the case of the beginners who have just generated bodhicitta. They are prone to forgetting bodhicitta. When their teacher is expounding bodhicitta, they may have some bodhicitta. However, when their teacher is not teaching bodhicitta, they may quickly lose it due to ingrained self-grasping and self-cherishing. Even if they pursue liberation, it might be for their own sake. This is a Hinayana tendency. Those who have just aroused bodhicitta must rely on spiritual teachers and friends. This is important. It is essential to grow in such an environment. It is similar to guiding children. Without teachers and classmates, it is hard for parents to guide their children. They won't listen to their parents because their karma is too strong. It is hard for parents to educate their kids. However, when children stay with teachers and classmates, they tend to be obedient and learn with others. Similarly, if you have just generated bodhicitta but often hang out with your loved ones and worldly people, you will forget bodhicitta. It is challenging. Beginners must avoid negative people. Those without bodhicitta and those with Hinayana habits, no matter who they are. In particular, you have to keep a distance from your loved ones because they can trigger your emotional attachment to grow. If you often hang out with them, how can you maintain bodhicitta? It would be fortunate if your emotional attachment doesn't grow. It is because they have samsaric minds. They are emotionally attached to you and regard you as a child. Even if you are already in your 40s or 50s, your mother still sees you as a child. In her eyes, you are always a child, not a bodhisattva. In such circumstances, how can you guide her? Therefore, it is crucial to associate with good spiritual teachers and friends. Having fellow practitioners on the Bodhisattva path is very important as it helps the arising and strengthening of Bodhicitta. Read the scriptures and commentaries that expound on Bodhicitta, accumulate merits and clear away karmic obstacles. Moreover, we should regularly read the sutras and treatises on bodhicitta. Reading is a way of practice. The Buddha's teachings can influence us greatly, and the treatises written by our great masters extract the essence from the sutras. Therefore, we need to read the sutras and treatises on bodhicitta. It helps us deepen our understanding of the merits of bodhicitta and strengthen our faith in the teachings of bodhicitta. Hence, the body's seed in our minds will grow stronger. For example, in the Flower Ornament Sutra, chapter on the merit of the initial determination for enlightenment, Bodhisattva Maitreya spoke praises about bodhicitta to Sadhana. Every time I read it, I feel deeply inspired. Based on the teachings in these sutras and treatises, we should also create the causes for generating bodhicitta. We need to accumulate these merits because it is hard to arouse bodhicitta without merits. 
Meanwhile, we should remove karmic obstacles. The habitual tendencies of the eight worldly concerns are all karmic obstacles. These are preliminary practices for cultivating buddhicitta. They help create a favourable mental environment for starting actual practice. This environment doesn't refer to the external material environment, but to the inner spiritual environment. We need to remove karmic obstacles. Our karmic obstacles, such as emotional attachment, self-grasping and habitual tendencies of the eight worldly concerns are deeply ingrained. For example, clinging to the human and heavenly vehicle is a karmic obstacle. They enjoy doing good deeds and accumulating merits. However, if you advise them to cultivate bodhicitta, they won't do it. This is also a karmic obstacle. They are not interested in cultivating bodhicitta, but are enthusiastic about doing good deeds. They can tirelessly engage in virtuous acts. They like to bring the suffering of change to others, considering it good and enjoying it. When we understand that the suffering of change is undesirable, we certainly won't bring it to others. If you don't want the suffering of change, you won't give it to sentient beings. If you train your mind in this way, you will definitely sow the seeds of perfect enlightenment. Although this work may seem insignificant, please take joy in it. If we follow a good spiritual teacher, read sutras and treatises, accumulate merits, and remove karmic obstacles as mentioned above, as well as train our minds through the seven steps of cause and effect meditation or exchanging self and others, we will sow the seeds of perfect enlightenment in our minds. This is the most important work in our lives and we should rejoice in it. The author said, Although this work may seem insignificant, This is an important point. Sometimes we may think nurturing the seed of bodhicitta seems insignificant. However, it can lead us to Buddhahood. Conversely, some individuals may appear to have a grand mission that benefits numerous sentient beings. However, what they bring to others is the suffering of change. What kind of welfare do they bring to people? It is the suffering of change. Their mission may appear grand and successful. However, it is a karmic obstacle that confines them to samsara. On the other hand, what we are doing here seems small, but what we achieve is the seed of perfect enlightenment. What we cultivate is the seed of perfect enlightenment. We use the best and most refined instrument to nurture the best seed in the world. Whereas, what use is it to grow watermelons? It may quench your thirst and bring pleasure. However, these two tasks are completely different. So, this is the most important work. Don't consider it insignificant and think, what use is it to sow this seed? It seems like sentient beings are not benefiting from it. That is not true. Because of your seed, all sentient beings will attain perfect Buddhahood in the future. We are sowing the seed of perfect enlightenment. Other seeds are not the seeds of perfect enlightenment. We should sow the best seed. We engage in only the most supreme mission. We don't sow other seeds. Although it is not easy to sow this seed, we must do it. Once we have sown the seed, we can gradually nurture it. This is what courageous and insightful individuals do. 
ordinary people lack this wisdom. They believe that sowing samsaric seeds is good, so they focus on sowing such seeds. For example, they may think, by planting rice, everyone will have food to eat and feel proud of themselves. But what is so remarkable about that? While you may address people's hunger, you cannot solve their fundamental problems. Therefore, nurturing the seed of perfect enlightenment is the most important work in our lives. Other things are not significant. Lama Atisha said, One who wishes to enter the door of the Mahayana teachings should cultivate Buddhacitta through effort over eons. It is like the sun that dispels darkness and the moon that quells the heat of afflictions. As Lama Atisha said, Buddhacitta is the key to entering the Mahayana path. It can dispel all darkness and afflictions in our minds, like the sun and moon. Because Buddhacitta is so excellent, it is worthwhile to strive for it, even if it takes countless lifetimes of effort. This means it is not easy to nurture this seed. We shall cultivate a genuine and qualified body seed. Even if it takes countless lifetimes of effort, it is worthwhile. We should nurture the best seed. We don't sow other seeds because it is futile to do so. What use is there in sowing seeds that cannot lead to Buddhahood? Don't sow samsaric seeds or Hinayana seeds. If you sow a Hinayana seed and become an Arhat, it can lead to trouble. Therefore, we should sow the seed of perfect enlightenment. No matter how poor we are or how long it takes to nurture this seed, it is worth it. We must recognize its importance. This passage explains the main points of exchanging self and others, eliminating self-grasping and cultivating compassion. They are the two merits of cultivating bodhicitta. Eliminating self-grasping is the merit of wisdom, while cultivating compassion is the merit of virtue. In addition, reading related sutras and treatises, following good spiritual teachers, accumulating merits and purifying obscurations are also essential preliminary practices for generating bodhicitta. This means we need to nurture bodhicitta. Reading sutras and treatises is a way to nourish compassion and seek blessings from the three jewels, as sutras and treatises carry the blessings of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. By following spiritual teachers, we can directly receive their blessings. The degree of exchanging self and others We have already explained the degree of exchanging self and others, and we should understand it. In the previous discussion, we have thoroughly explained the extent to which the practice of exchanging self and others should reach. We need to have a clear understanding of this. In terms of depth, can we exchange ourselves and others without reservation, seeing ourselves as others and others as ourselves? It is not easy to reach this depth. How should we swap ourselves and others? What depth should we achieve? Without reservation means exchanging ourselves and others unconditionally and completely. When we practice, we often set conditions. We may think, under what circumstances can I exchange myself and others? Should it be a complete exchange or a partial one? This is about the depth and breadth of our practice. In terms of depth, we should be able to swap ourselves and others without reservation. 
in terms of breadth, can we exchange ourselves with all sentient beings without accepting some and rejecting others? You may be willing to exchange yourself with some beings, but not those you dislike. That is not what we should do. We should be able to exchange ourselves and all sentient beings. If you have preferences or exclusions, you lack equanimity and buddhacitta. Those who have buddhacitta won't abandon any sentient being. They treat all beings equally. Okay, we have completed the study of this practice. Many things in life can inspire our buddhacitta. Some people may find it hard to cultivate buddhacitta because they haven't developed a qualified renunciation. Without a qualified renunciation, it is impossible to cultivate buddhacitta. They perceive everything as permanent. They haven't thoroughly meditated on the impermanence of life and the suffering of samsara, especially the three types of suffering. Before cultivating the seed of buddhacitta, it is essential to nurture the seed of renunciation. It is a prerequisite. Many people want to cultivate buddhacitta but cannot achieve it and find it difficult. It is because they haven't laid a solid foundation. If one incubates Buddha Cheetah step by step, they can surely hatch it. However, if one doesn't follow the steps of practice, they won't arouse Buddha Cheetah.